Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone. We have been blessed to see another day, another time to celebrate the resurrection of our King, who is risen and is alive forevermore. It's a wonderful time to be in the kingdom. Things are going on, but what a great privilege to be able to still worship God and rejoice in the God of our salvation at this time. We're so excited, so thankful that you've joined us um, at Living Word Healing and Restoration Ministries this morning and pray that your heart is rejoicing in the God who has saved you, who has redeemed you, that in spite of everything that is going on in our world, our God remains the same, the same good, eternal, everlasting God that he always has been. Praise the Lord. So we're going to go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. And we're going to have our minister, George Scott, lead us in to prayer this morning. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this moment that we pause every year to think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That, God, we know that this is part of the foundation of our belief in you, of our salvation in you, God. And that, Lord, we know that it's important for, uh, the, for the covering of our sins, God. So, Lord, we thank you, God, that the one who's resurrected is living in us. That, God, because you overcame death, hell, and the grave, Father, we have the ability to overcome every trial, every tribulation, God. We have the ability, God, to destroy the works of the enemy, God. And the seed of life is living inside of us, God. So we are reminded today, God, that we have the life of God in us and flowing through us. And because you are in us and you are living in us, God, we have the ability to come through every trial, every tribulation, God, that we are faced with in our lives. So, Lord, I pray, oh God, for your power and your presence to be present in every home, everywhere, every person may be that's watching or listening to this cast, God. I pray, oh God, for the Holy Spirit to infuse their atmosphere, that it would destroy yokes and loose shackles, God. That, Lord, the resurrection power, God, that is in your hands will come into their rooms, God. We pray for the presence of God to destroy every yoke, God. Lift burdens, heal hearts, set people free, God. As they hear the worship, as they hear the word of God, we pray for an encounter with you, God. We just thank you, God, and give you praise for this day. We pray that you will bless as we worship, bless as the word comes forth, and we'll give your name the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
the rock upon which we stand and our foundation, our anchor in these troubled waters. God is so good. He's so faithful. We praise the Lord and we hope that your hearts are now prepared, prepared to hear what the Lord is going to say to us today. And we are going to bring on Apostle Larry Herring to share what the Lord has to say to us on this Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. God is a good God, and as you've heard through the songs, they were so inspiring. Jesus has risen from the dead. God is alive. Thank God he's not in the grave. And he's the risen king, and death, hell nor the grave, could not hold him down. I am so glad that we serve such a powerful God and that resurrection power is alive and available for you and I today. And you can be affected by this power. Even on this resurrection Sunday, the day set aside as Easter Sunday, resurrection life is available for all of us. And I thank God. Somehow or another, the distinctive characteristic of this gospel that we preach is Christ not only died for our sins, but he rose again for our justification. That's remarkable. And it tells us that he's the first fruit. And because he's the first fruit, because he lived, we shall live also. Because he rose, we will rise from the dead. Isn't that some hope? God bless you today. I am so grateful to God. And before the close of this uh, passage of, uh, before the close of this uh, teaching, I want to pray for you today that God will meet you at the point of your need, that God will touch your life. If you have sickness in your body, if your heart has been broken or wounded, then I want to pray that God's divine life will minister unto you in a very significant way. So stay with us. I also have a passage of scripture that I want to share with you and I trust that it will be a blessing on this special day. God is alive, and I am so grateful. Look with me now to the Word of God. The Bible says here in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. I want to just share with you a thought that came to me over the past few days concerning God. We are reminded through this passage of Scripture Christ's purpose for coming. He came to save men's lives. And that just struck my heart in a very uh, precious way, just remembering uh, Christ and why he came. And just want to talk to you briefly about how that we should know the spirit that we are of. We are of God. John said, we, ye are of God, little children. And you've overcome the world. And the Bible tells us that God is love. And God said also in the book of John also, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And we're in this age of grace now where God is reaching out to save and to embrace people's lives that's been broken and battered and bruised and, and the things uh, that sin has done to uh, suffering and hurting humanity. 
God is redeeming and saving and healing, and he wants to bring the life to you and I. So I thank God for this great reminder, that which our faith is based upon, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And uh, the Bible says if there's no resurrection, then our faith is all void and in vain. But it's not in vain. Christ rose, so our expectation is to rise. Hallelujah. Praise God. So in this passage here, we find, and as I was looking in chapter 9, I was just going back and reading some of the um, things that took place up to this point. And there was the feeding of the 5,000 there. You see Jesus showing himself as the bread of life. And our mind go back to the experience of the wilderness when manna fell from heaven. But Jesus here was the bread that came from heaven, that if a man eat thereof, he shall not die but live. And uh, then we, we see some other uh, things that took place there. Uh, but the other thing that really kind of struck me was the transfiguration. When Christ took Peter, James, and John up on the mount, and he was transfigured before them. His face did shine. His clothes was just, there was a brilliance that they had not seen and uh, radiating from him, through him. And, um, and But in the vision there was Moses and Elijah. And the disciples, as they saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and I was just thinking, Lord, uh, what was the purpose in this transfiguration why you selected these three? We realized and we've been told that they were in the inner circle of Christ. And uh, uh, there was something special about his revealing things to them. There were things that he made, allowed them to see that some of the others were not privileged to see. So as I was thinking on that, I thought about uh, uh, James, who was the first to be martyred. It was important for him to know the reality of this great God in spite of the things that he was to face. Then I looked at Peter, and Peter was the one that Satan desired to sift him as wheat. And he could not because God, Jesus said, I prayed for you. And so Peter would experience denial, but it was important for him also. The special uh, revelation that God revealed himself as God's son. And then, of course, John was found on the Isle of Patmos, outlived the others, and perhaps heard in the martyrdom of all the others. But he was to bring in this great revelation, and God used him to share in the book of Revelation the things that he was going to do and that should come to pass on the earth. There's always purposes when God reveals himself to us. And sometimes people may get caught up in just the glory of the revelation, not understanding that God always does things for a purpose. And when, uh, before Jesus went through his wilderness experience, there was a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Satan would come and buffet him and try to tell him or make him question his identity. If you be the son of God, do this and do that. And, but there was an affirmation even before he had this uh, temptation in the wilderness. God is a God of purpose. And these things are done in purpose. And um, there was other things that uh, caught my mind, but this passage that I read today uh, is, is very important here. Um, Jesus was causing us to see something that I want you to see briefly. He said, you know not what manner of spirit that you are of. It is important for us to know at this time whose we are and what we're all about. Then he said, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save. And Jesus does not change. This is, uh, that was his desire and mission here on earth. He gave his life as a ransom to save us, to save us. And uh, there was a, a two or three things I just want to leave you with today and on this special day. Our attitudes toward people will determine our approach. Our attitudes toward people will determine our approach. And you look at this passage, and you see uh, the disciples 
uh, you see the disciples here that um, Jesus pointed out, they, uh, the, they had a certain attitude toward the Samaritans. And there's a little history there uh, during the cap Assyrian captivity. But and you see there were others brought into the land and mixed with the Jews there. And they became what they known as half-breeds. But the, the point that I want to make is that these uh, disciples had an attitude and the Jews had an attitude. And the woman at the well uh, displayed that, uh, she told about this attitude that they have. She said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. She did not say that the Samaritans have no dealings with the Jews. She said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. So there was a certain mindset and attitude that the Jews had toward the Samaritans. And so when uh, Jesus shows in this passage of scripture here uh, that, as I said, our attitudes can determine our approach toward people's life. And Jesus had a total different attitude toward uh, the people of Samaria, although they did not uh, want to receive him because his face was set as though he was purposed to go to Jerusalem. And so uh, the Samaritan didn't want to receive him. But Peter and John's attitude was, Lord, shall we call down fire? to destroy them like Elijah did. And I found in the transfiguration that Jesus began to display the certainty of the purposes of Jesus coming here on earth as the son of God. And he wanted, he began to, in different uh, speeches and teachings, to tell them uh, and alert them and prepare them uh, for this transition from moving them from the law and the prophets until the time of God's wonderful grace, when things would happen like they just couldn't imagine. The favor of God would be upon all humanity. God wanted to save. And so here was an instance where their minds were set like the Old Testament prophets and so on. And, and they recall when Elijah called down fire from heaven and burned up several groups of fifties. But Jesus wanted them to see something. He says, you do not know what manner of spirit that you are of. And I wanted to just remind us today that in the midst of the things that we're going through, uh, that we must have that same Christ-like attitude. Jesus came to save and rescue. And also, think about this with me. The scribes and the Pharisees gave him the most trouble, and they were supposed to be the religious group, right? But it was their attitude when Jesus came, even toward the sinners, that Jesus pointed out. And they could not grasp uh, his dealings. They could not understand why he was uh, uh, favorable towards sinners. But he had a mission and a purpose. And his purpose was to save, to rescue. And I want to reiterate that to you. Jesus' purpose has not changed. And during this age of grace, God is still reaching out to save mankind. So we look at the things that are going on in our world today, and we want to have that same attitude, knowing the spirit that we are of. We want to, uh, uh, to see people saved. What can I do? What can I do in this time of crisis to see people saved? What can I do to see people help? I can pray. I can seek the Lord's help on the behalf of these people. And think about it. This, this virus is carrying on and causing a lot of pain and hardship to many people. And there are people out there that don't know God. But just imagine if that coronavirus to come and touch one of our loved ones. How painful or devastating that would be. So we want to have a heart to reach out, a heart of love and mercy toward people at this time. Uh, it is so critical. We are the salt of the earth, as I said before. We are the lights of the world, so we want to point people to the right way. Yes, things are happening beyond our control and beyond the control of the world, but what we can do is show the love of Jesus Christ by praying for people and doing what else we can do to let them know there's hope in the midst of the suffering. And I want to encourage you in that manner so our attitude can determine they saw the rebellion of the people of, the, of Maria, and so they just said, let's deal with them, God. Shall we deal with them? Shall we call down fire? And, uh, but we can have a Christ-like attitude. 
what can we do to see God rescue them in a different way? The other thing that I saw is when, when we know God's purpose for sending his son was to save and not to destroy, then we can always be on the Lord's side and thinking with the help of God the way he's thinking about a situation or circumstances. Jesus looked for opportunities to display the purposes of God. He looked for opportunities in every situation, and we can do the same. Jesus' purpose never changed. I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Remember the word of God in Romans 5 that says, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. God's got grace for people at this hour. If we will only reach out and see the way Jesus is seeing, he sees so many opportunities for us at this hour. So if we'll see as he sees, God will show us and give us opportunities to rescue, to be a blessing to many people at this time. And then, of course, finally, uh, I want to say that um, God has given us of his spirit. God is spirit. And God is life. God is love. John said, He that loveth not does not know God, because God is love. Love. There's so much to say about love. Love forgives. Jesus said that uh, in Matthew, I think it was 5, when he was talking about Love your enemies. Do good to them that harm you. Pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you. Look at that spirit. Look at that attitude. Look at the spirit that we are of. And so many times, uh, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves having to move from the pharisaical kind of attitude, one of judgment, to the right spirit that we are of. We are of God, little children, and we must love not only one another, but we must love uh, the opportunities that God gives us the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish, would not be destroyed, but have life forever. This is the heart of God. God desires that. I believe that. I believe that because God never changed. And we are coming close to the time of the Lord's coming back again. But I want to leave with you during this Resurrection Sunday. There's something that we can do. We can pray. We can seek the face of God. And then we can ask God, Lord, what else can I do to be a blessing? Is there some family that has experienced the, uh, the tragedy of uh, losing a loved one? Is there someone that we can be holding them up in prayer or minister to them, minister hope or life to them? Is there something that can be done? And I will assure you that there is. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. A bruised reed nor a smoking flax. He'll not quench nor put out. He wants to help. He wants to save. He wants to rescue. He was on a rescue mission. He says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to themselves, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That same word, and you and I are ambassadors for Christ. Let's go now and do the will of God. Let's pray earnestly. Let's reach out to somebody. Let's be a blessing to somebody of, on this Resurrection Sunday. Well, my time is gone. I want to pray for you finally. I want to pray for those that are listening. And there may be somebody that uh, has not made a decision for Christ. There may be someone listening and saying, well, I never thought about it that way. There may be someone that says, uh, yeah, uh, but, I, but, but I've, I've had some issues. I've had some difficulties in the past, and uh, it's not easy for me to look at life in that manner. But whatever the situation may be, whatever your issues, can I encourage you to let's look to Jesus. 
Life is going to go out to somebody today. Healing is going to go out to somebody today. Because of Jesus Christ. Because of his resurrection power. Because of the divine life that is in him. God is going to do something to you. If you listen today, I want you to join in with me in prayer. And I assure you that God is going to touch you in a very significant way. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come confidently to the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. There are those that are listening right now, Father, listening, Lord God, desiring a word from God, desiring to know your mind, your heart. I pray, Father, for them, Lord God, that an illumination will come. A revelation as the word has gone forth will touch and hit their hearts in a very unique way by your power. I pray, Lord, for those that are sick and shut in. I pray also for those, Lord God, whose mind uh, are giving them such a challenge. I pray for those whose hearts have been broken and they're bleeding and wounded at this time. Father God, touch them now. By your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we know that you'll do more than we ask. Bless them. Move by your Spirit into their homes and into their hearts and attitudes now, Lord God. This is the day that is set aside on this time of the year, Lord, as we commemorate the resurrection of our God. Let life go. Let healing flow like never before. Let them know that you're alive. You're not dead. You're not in a grave. You're not a figment of people's imagination. You're not a has-been, but you are the living Christ that rose from the dead and death could not hold your life back in the grave. For it was ordained of the Father that you rise from the dead. Now we can call upon you. We can have that life. Give it to someone today. Save and heal. In Jesus' name we pray. I thank you, Father, for hearing me now. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you today. Until next time.